Your logo looks good on these slides. I like the uh, it, contrast of the colors. Yeah, it does look good. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our, our meeting today about small businesses and cyber threats. A uh, little brief discussion today we're going to do. We're going to talk about some managed detection and response, MDR, which is kind of the new and uh, very important thing for most small businesses to learn about is what MDR is really about and how it can help you. Um, it's a new product that Seamless is now starting to really carry and push out. And, and, and you know, we, we're a crawl, walk, run kind of company. So we always start out slow. We test things and then we like it. And then we, we put it out for some trials. That's our crawl stage. And now we're past that and we're, we're, we're up and we're walking. We're not quite running yet, but we're, we're really getting close to, to that run stage for this product. And uh, we brought uh, Jason. He's a, he's a big expert here with uh, – um, ConnectWise, he's going to talk to us today about this product and, and make us understand how how important it is and why it's important and all the kind of great things. We're going to give it a couple more minutes for the last couple stragglers to join us. Um, and if you do have any questions, I'm just going to go over some of the things today. There, you know, everybody's muted. You can't talk. There's no no other videos besides the great seamless people and and our our Kaseya guest, Jason. But if you have questions, there's a Q&A, and during the uh, session, I will try to answer as many of the Q&As as possible, and you can put stuff in there. And if there are any things that you, you have any questions about, we can try to answer those during the meeting or after the meeting. Um, you can always follow up with me directly or shoot us an email, and we'll, we'll follow up with you. Um, and, and with that, I'd like to introduce Jason. If you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your background or Oh, I guess I guess that's your next slide, so I don't want to give that away yet, huh? We'll, we'll hold off for another couple of minutes. Oh, he, he's jumping to it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, John. J-O-N, that's how my dad spelled his name, actually. Most of the time, and every time you tell somebody what your name is, they put down J-O-H-N, don't they? Like, nope, no, nope, it's J-O-N. You know? <laughs> well, it's because it, it was Jonathan, and I had to shorten it because I, I just thought Jonathan just sounded too formal. Um, and my brother's Benjamin, so we're Benjamin and Jonathan, and so it just... We were like, no. So he's Ben and I'm John. And we we nobody even calls us by our real names, not even our mom. So we yeah. do shorten it. And you're right, everybody, everybody adds the H in there. So it's kind of funny. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm Jason McNeil. I live near Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, about eight miles north of the square uh, in the Pennsylvania Fruit Belt, kind of a rural farming area. We don't even have any any neighbors out here. I'm a veteran in the United States Air Force. I spent a bunch of years at the White House Communications Agency and 10 years at uh, Camp David. Uh, so think, you know, buildings with no windows, surrounded by barbed wire and machine guns and those kinds of things, extreme security environments. I had a presidential access clearance though, uh, during that time, which is known as Yankee White. And what that means is that it means you're permitted to be in the president's so the POTUS, president of the United States, unescorted. You know, just go, go right and do what you need to do. Uh, in 2017, I founded Stronghold Cybersecurity, and Stronghold Cybersecurity worked mainly with defense industrial based companies doing NIST and CMMC consulting, cybersecurity maturity model certification. Uh, but I also worked with legal metal, medical manufacturing, hospitality, and a bunch of other verticals. Um, I have my degrees on the wall behind me here, Master of Professional Studies uh, from Penn State in Information Assurance. I'm also a CISSP, Certified Information System Security Professional. Um, I, would consider, I would consider that certification in terms of difficulty probably fairly similar to the uh, CPA test. Um, my dad was a CPA. I'm sure that he would disagree if I said that, but <laughs> that's, that's my opinion. So, this, this is kind of a joke slide. This is a couple of years old now, but um, uh, things have changed, right? Think about 1998, late 1999, late 1990s. It was it was considered, uh, you know, taboo to meet people on the internet, right? 1998, don't get into stranger cars, don't meet people from the internet. 2017, referring to Uber, of course, literally summoned strangers from the internet to get into their car. That's what we do. Things have changed. You know, another. Another example that comes into mind here for me is, do you remember those um, PC versus Mac commercials from a couple of years ago, John? I do. The yes, they were really great. Because yeah, remember the remember the you know the the Mac guy was cool and the PC guy was like a dork, right? 
And then when Microsoft started coming up with those UX, those user access controls, do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? So on and so forth. Apple started making fun of them. And they had the commercial there where they had the PC guy and he had, you know, a, a guy dressed like the Secret Service dressed to him, uh, dressed like him. And, you know, I just got a, a new iPhone and you have to white list everything, every single thing. So the, the truth is that Microsoft was right about that and Apple was wrong. That's that's how security works now. Just a few years later, when you take something out of the box, nothing works by default anymore. You have to allow it. Can I use the camera? Uh, can I use the microphone? Can I use the thumbprint scanner? Can I use your GPS? Can I use this? Can I use that? Yes, yes, no, 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 right? Um, that's all whitelisting. So think just how much that's changed in the last couple of years. So those commercials were funny at the time, but Apple was uh, Apple was wrong about that. So I'm going to talk about what is cybersecurity. And now cybersecurity is one word. It used to be two words. And before that, we called it information assurance. So that's changed too, right? Information assurance doesn't sound very, uh, very exciting. So this is a can definition. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just read this right off my slide. Cybersecurity is the body of technologies, processes, and practices designed to protect computers, handheld, and other internet connected devices, networks, programs, and data from attack, damage, or unauthorized access. Okay, that all sounds great, but you know what? So what? Uh, cybersecurity is about managing risk, period. So uh, that's what I do in profession. I'm a risk manager. Um, for most businesses, security, it's a cost center. It costs money. It does. It's not a revenue center. Uh, it's just like your fire extinguishers and your fire alarms and all that other stuff. These, these things are necessary in order to reduce your risk. So, you know, security only makes sense to the extent that it reduces your business risk or saves you money. That's what we're here to do. Reduce your business risk or save you money, not just sell you technology. Uh, so here's here's our agenda. Now, since we're talking you know, with our, our partners, our SMB partners, uh, our MSP partners or SMBs, there's a couple of lead up subjects that we're going to talk about before we get into MDR because there's a lot of managed detection and response because it's just a number of things that we want to talk about. Um, and also, I'm not going to bore people by talking about the same thing for 45 minutes or an hour or, or an hour straight, right? I think I would probably lose everybody if we tried to do that. Um, so we're going to talk about the, th the top securities concerns uh, for the SMB, for the small to mid-sized businesses. We're going to talk about some of the SEAM uh, and NDR, security information event monitoring, MDR, the benefits of these, some of these things, uh, MDR solutions, compliance and regulations. And uh, some of the listeners here, I, you know, they're in verticals that I believe will have some, uh, some compliance that they need to deal with. <laughs> Uh, and then we're going to talk about the importance of security risk assessments and why you should get one from from Seamless, which is something I feel very, very strongly about. So we're going to talk about security concerns. Uh, SMBs or targets. Um, you know, it used to be when I presented live, I would say, who here thinks they're not a target? And probably 25% of the hands would go up. Um, nowadays, I see less than that. At one time, it might have been 50%. But I think people are starting to realize, businesses are starting to realize you're all a target. And, and these these threat actors, the hacker, hackers and crypto, lock, crypto locker and malware and all these other things, there's two basic criteria that they go by um, for the targets they're picking. Um, do you have money? And it doesn't have to be a lot. And can they get it? That's it, John. Do you have money and can they get it? Uh, and Jason, I got to say, we've even had customers as small as one employee that were crypto locked and had a ransomware attack. So big, yeah. small or medium, they go after everybody. They're not discriminating and they're figuring out later whether or not there's money or not to get. But they they don't care what they destroyed it to find money and they're going after everybody these days. So everybody is a target. So Literally everything's a target and they're complete. They're very entrepreneurial they're it's naked capitalism frankly um all organizations are being targeted and they don't care if you're they don't care if you're a church they don't care if you're a nonprofit. um they don't care if you're a factory uh you know if you're a bigger company with more money that's even better but they're completely unscrupulous so like i said again, i'm going to say it again the criteria are do you have money and it doesn't have to be a lot and can they get it somehow that's it and if those two conditions are true they're going to go after you and even if they're not true they're going to go after you anyway I'm going to talk about the uh, Verizon 2022 data breach investigation report. And this thing comes out. This is, oh, heck, 18, uh, 14, since 2008. This comes out every year. And people in my line of work will read this thing every year, cover to cover. 
Um, it's about 120 pages. There's a lot of data in it. Um, and we get kind of geek out of it, uh, geek out about the thing. It reminds me of getting the Sears catalog when I was a kid. You know, <laughs> like, oh, it's great. It's all kinds of stuff in here. Um, so according to the DBIR, there's four key paths leading to the compromise of your company credentials. Credential theft is easy, uh, penetration testing, phishing, exploit vulnerabilities, and, and botnets. And not everybody knows what a botnet is. And I'm going to explain that briefly. And botnets are the reason why everything is a target, including grandma's iPad or your computer, just anything. Because if you compromise 10,000 endpoints that have weaknesses in them, then you could use those, you could connect those to a command and control server and then use those to attack an actual target that you want to get into, something big, right? Uh, that, that's what in the military we call that a force multiplier. So now we have an army of 10,000 bots that are just whatever grandma's computer, kid's computer, computers in schools, whatever you could think of, and they're using that to attack other things. Uh, no organization is safe without a plan to handle uh, uh, all of these things. And then phishing, I think probably everybody knows what phishing is. And let me tell you why why phishing is still such a big problem. The best analogy I can make, it's, it's simple. Uh, uh, it's just the law of averages, right? We all get junk mail. You go out to your mailbox and you get junk mail. You get flyers and stuff like that. And the reason that marketing companies still do that is because it works, period. It's it's a numbers game, right? So, um, you know, talk to a marketing professional and they'll tell you that if we send out 10,000 of these things, 30 people might read it. And then out of those three, out of those 33 might actually convert to sales or something like that. So it, may, it makes sense to do it. And phishing is exactly the same way. Um, a hacker or a threat actor knows if they send out 10,000 phishing emails that they're going to get a certain uh, number of responses to that pretty reliably. So that's why this continues to be a problem. So uh, in the DBIR, I'm gonna talk about some of the security concepts quickly at kind of uh, kind of a high level. Uh, an asset's anything that has value in a company, and that could be intellectual property. It could be policies, pre procedures, it could be people, it could be physical equipment, just anything that has value to the company. A threat is anything that has the potential to damage assets, and that's not necessarily just a hacker. That could be a mistake. Somebody hits a utility pole. Um, it could be a hurricane. It could be a fire, man-made disaster, natural disaster, anything that has the potential to damage an asset, whether it's virtually, physically, or otherwise. Um, threat actors are persons or organizations carrying out a threat, and these are kind of all over the place. Um, a lot of them are overseas and they take advantage of jurisdictions so that the police can't do anything about it. But you have these various um, advanced persistent threats, could be the People's Liberation Army or could be the Russian Business Network. Or uh, frankly, in some cases, we've had problems with our own allies stealing our intellectual property from the defense industrial base. A vulnerability is an opening or a weakness to a system. Remember WannaCry, I'll probably talk about that a little bit more. Um, but there's been a bunch of those things in the news over the years. So, and a brand new, there, there's probably openings today that we don't know about. We call those zero day exploits. They're very, very valuable to hackers. But a vulnerability is an opening or a weakness in a system. And a vulnerability could be uh, an unpatched system, a system that's uh, configured incorrectly. It could be a poorly trained user that constantly makes bad decisions, clicks on phishing emails or wires money and that kind of thing. An exploit is the process of taking advantage of a vulnerability to attack. And an exploit, that could be social engineering. You could be making a phone call and then asking somebody for their password. Hey, I'm the system administrator and I need to check something, blah, blah, blah. Um, or it could be a piece of malicious logic like a virus or a worm or malware or something like that. And then uh, last, lastly, one of the other things the DBI gar goes over is ransomware as a service. And I think we all know what ransomware is just by reading the news, but ransomware as a service, frankly, is just a way to scale, right? Uh, these things look, act, taste, and smell like real businesses. They exist to make money. They have engineers. They have uh, 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 project managers. They have schedules. They have financial targets. They have all these things, right? And most businesses think about scale. Well, how do we, how do we you know, increase revenue? How do we increase our reach? How do we increase marketing? So uh, they came up with ransomware and then they kind of created a package so they could distribute it and then get, you know, kickbacks 10 or 15 or 20 percent or something like that. Right. So if you have 10 people that are each doing a million dollars in business or something like that, well, now you're collecting a check for people that are doing work for you. They're deputizing uh, um, others. 
And a lot of these are just small time. It could be, you know, just one person or two people that are doing this ransomware as a service to make money. This slide talks about uh, from again from the DBI uh, DBIR some of the top threat actor profiles. Uh, and you, you may have seen some of these in the news. They're in the DBIR. Um, Connectwise, we have them in our own in our own literature, our own technical literature. But there are some names here you may have seen: Con, uh, Conti, Hive, Avad, and so on and so forth. Uh, but look on the right here. We have something called TTPs shared by all five groups, and TTPs are techniques, tactics, and procedures. Think about uh, a serial killer, right? Um, let's say that we've had a number of crimes and then the detectives or the FBI come in and they start investigating these things and they see clear patterns. Um, they see reconnaissance, certain types of victims, ways that they get, gain ac access, ingress, the way they commit the crime, things they do to cover up the crime. That's kind of exactly what TTPs are. It's the same sort of thing. Think of a serial killer, right? So when we investigate a breach after the fact, um, when they come from these advanced persistent threats, the ones that are or organized or from organized crime, they tend to have fairly consistent methods, right? So we could go in and then do forensics and then look at how they gained access, how they moved laterally through the systems, how long they stayed there, what they took, what they did, um, what they did in order to evade defenses. And then we get an idea of who done it. And that's how we that's how we footprint these things or uh, fingerprint these threat actors. This is another slide uh, about ransomware as a service. I already covered this, so I'm not going to go over it uh, too much. But um, when we send out the slides after the fact, John, we'll make these available uh, as a PDF to everybody that's watching, and then and then you can read this. But it it kind of gives you an idea how 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 they do this. Look on the far right of the slide, though. Here, though, uh, criminal help desks. They literally do have help desks, right? Uh, and the reason they do that is because they're conscientious about protecting their business model. They want people to pay and they know that if they don't give them what they say they're going to give them, they're not going to pay. So they've been known to call people up and walk them through decrypting their data and actually help them out. Their customers, some of them have good customer service, so to speak, oddly enough. Paying a ransom rarely works. This particular slide comes from, now there's different schools of thought on this and you see different statistics. This particular one says 65% of data is restored after paying the ransom. I think it's actually a little bit higher than that based on my own reading. And depending on who you talk to, you'll get different answers on this. Now think about this, most of um, uh, ConnectWise's partners and their clients, they're small to mid-sized businesses, right? So imagine that you're running a first or a second generation business, you started it or your parents started it and you're using it to pay for your kid's college, and you're using it to fund your retirement, and then you get crypto locker, right? And you're not able to function. And your options are uh, to either pay the ransom and then have a 75% chance of getting your data back or go out of business. That's a, that's a tough position to be in, right? Now, uh, law enforcement will normally tell you don't pay it, and that sounds good, but if you're gonna go out of business, if you don't pay it, this now becomes a business decision for you, right? Um, I think the number is actually a little bit higher, but if you get put in this position, you're, you're going to have to make this business decision based on risk. Am I going to pay this money based on how much it is based on some probability that I'm going to get my data back? That's a tough position that nobody wants to be in um, at all. But you got to understand, even if you, you pay it and you get the encryption key back, it's not it's not like turning a switch back on. That's right? exactly correct. There's, there's a, a significant risk that you will not get your data back. That's a crummy position to be in. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're having this webinar. I don't want anybody here in that position ever. Yeah. So the, the numbers are, these are trending upward. The cost of cleaning these things up, these are the 2020 and the 2021 numbers and the 2022 numbers are all starting to get studied and it continues to go up. But the cost of cleaning these messes up has, has about doubled on a year over year basis. And that includes, um, number one, you have all this remediation and cleanup, and then you have security insurance and uh, and lo lost revenue on top of it. And cybersecurity insurance doesn't cover lost business revenue costs. It'll cover the cleanup. Uh, you need business insurance in order to cover lost revenue. And if you're down for a week or two weeks and you can't make widgets or sell widgets or service your customers, you're going to lose money.
So everyday challenges for the small to mid-sized business. This stuff is, this subject material is thick. Um, it, it's hard to get a hold of the talent in particular. Uh, you're really well-trained cybersecurity people are hard to find. They're difficult to employ. They cost a lot of money. And there's a lot of confusion, you know, IT challenges versus the business challenge. And one of the things, one point I really want to impart on people is that cybersecurity and IT are they're separate they're separate disciplines. They're not the same. Um, IT is a service delivery issue. Uh, IT is making sure that you could move and manipulate uh, your data in order to support operations. It's making sure your computers work. Cybersecurity is capturing and quantifying the risks that are associated with operating an information system and then systematically reducing that risk in a way that aligns with your business objectives. They are separate disciplines. Um, 10, 15 years ago, uh, cybersecurity was thought to be an IT problem. They thought, oh, well, IT takes care of it. It's just no longer the case. It's a separate thing, sort of like your safety program. Safety and operations are separate, right? They're separate things. Uh, cybersecurity and IT are separate things. They're separate things. It's difficult to manage cybersecurity with competing priorities. You already have all these other things to do, you know, operations, logistics, finance, sales, marketing, so on and so forth. And now we have cybersecurity on top of all this. Um, juggling all these things in a small to mid-sized business is difficult, but that's what Seamless Solutions is for, is to help you, is to help you manage these things, you know, get some of this off your plate. Uh, the complexity of shifting to a remote workforce, that was already happening prior to 2019. In 2019, we had the lockdowns, and boy, that really, that just really accelerated that. Um, and it's made things, you know, more complex because, you know, it used to be understood that when your IT assets were in garrison, so to speak, that they were behind the firewall, that they were protected. But now people, they're working really from anywhere, right? Um, I live in a cornfield and I work for a large tech company, you know. Uh, poor communications between organizations and their uh, managed IT service providers. It, it's important for the clients to, and I know that Seamless Solutions does this. I know that you're reaching out to your clients and making sure that we're talking about security and not just IT service delivery, but that really, it just really needs to be a two-way street because it's, it's important for you to protect yourself. Make sure that you're having this this conversation with John and his people about security. You know, are we doing get an assessment? Are we doing the right things? Are we covered? You know, do we have an incident response plan? What happens when you know the storm arrives? What do we do? Uh, poor cybersecurity skill sets within the organization. There's a massive gap in talent. There aren't enough people to fill. Uh, all these cybersecurity positions that are open. And what's worse is the talent that does exist tends to get vacuumed up by big companies that are flush with cash, right? Um, and it makes it even harder for small companies in the SMB space to find and hire cybersecurity talent, which is why, you know, we have these partnerships in place with companies like Seamless Solutions and ConnectWise so that you could leverage and then get access um, to people like uh, people like myself and people like John on an as needed basis because trying to hire, you know, hire people like this. I mean, frankly, even even if you live in upstate Michigan or you live in Tennessee or something like that, um, the full labor burden for somebody like, you know, th that has a, a couple of years of experience is well over one hundred thousand dollars, one thirty, one forty factoring in, uh, uh, you know, benefits, and all that stuff. They're they're expensive and it's hard to keep them. Uh, one other thing we run into is ad hoc business continuity and disaster recovery efforts. Do not have this stuff ad hoc. Um, have a BCDR plan. Have an incident response plan. Work with Seamless Solutions on those things if you don't have them now. And again, we already covered this increased cost to respond and recover from an incident. It keeps going up. Uh, we'll hand these out after. If you're interested in these threat actor profiles from 2021 and you want to read up on, you know, the whodunits a little bit more, um, some people find this stuff interesting, you can go ahead and look at information from ConnectWise's Cyber Research Unit. I've got a QR code here uh, that goes directly to that link. We're only human. A person is involved at the center of most security events. This is true. And I know this is true because I've done white hat hacking and penetration testing. I've done it personally. Um, and what I can tell you is that what we normally find is that the technical defenses are usually adequate, not always. Um, and then you're always going to move the low hanging fruit. And if we can't get through the firewall or the servers or whatever is internet facing um, or get, you know, 
uh, then what we're going to do is start attacking attacking your humans via social engineering, phishing, and that kind of stuff. This number here says um, this comes from Verizon. 82% of breaches are result from human elements. In my own empirical experience, that sounds that sounds pretty accurate to me because um, I get the think of times where we use you know phishing attacks in order to you know break into whatever. 66% of breaches involve phishing or stolen credentials. That sounds about right. Stealing credentials is easy, by the way. Um, social engineering can do it. We could brute force stuff. We could use rainbow tables. There's a bunch of different automated ways that we could use to break into accounts. Uh, and if we can't do it through automated means, then we're going to use social engineering and then trick you into giving your password. That's why multi-factor authentication is important. You need MFA uh, because stealing passwords is easy. Look at this number at the bottom here. 2.9% of employees may click on phishing emails. Remember what I said before about um, uh, about junk mail? It's the same exact principle. If you send out 10 or 100,000 or a million of these things, I'm going to get fairly reliable return on investment for this stuff. It's a numbers game. It's the law of averages. The marketing people know this. Salespeople know this. And hackers know this. It's just law of averages, period. Numbers. It's going to work. SMBs can significantly reduce their attack surface. There's a couple of things, if I'm scaring you, and you know, it's kind of my job, right? There's a couple of things that you could do right now to start really kind of reducing the risk of having a bad outcome. Um, things that are easy and relatively cheap. Uh, adopt well, email. Jason, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but uh, you're on a good roll. But I think that number's a little low on 2.9%. Click on it. I think that should be much higher. But also, seamless offers to all of our our managed network services customers at no charge, our phishing training and security for all employees. So I hope everybody's taking advantage of that. And I know that my staff is working diligently on all managed network services customers to get everybody on MFA today for, for email. If not, if you want to go to the next level, we have an option for that too. So I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Sorry. No, I just wanted to throw that out there that we we give that free phishing training to you guys. So take advantage of it. Make sure that you're you're learning and understanding and and following that because it's got all the stuff about good hygiene and what to look for in a mail and all that kind of stuff. But also additionally, we're helping you guys get that uh, multi-factor authentication set up today. So make sure if you haven't done it that you reach out to uh, our help desk and they're 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 working diligently through everybody to get that done for a hundred percent of our customer base thanks i'm sorry yeah no i'm not, not going to disagree with you because like i said when you read different reports you see some variations in these numbers and then sometimes like the one i said i saw before it said 65 percent like no it's higher than that i know it is from my own experience you know what i mean um and different reports have different things and then, you know, depending on the verticals you serve and what your customers are like and where you are regionally and what education levels are, there's all kinds of variation here. You know what I mean? So for some, some people are going to say from an empirical perspective, I think it's higher. You know, these numbers are not concrete. They're general, generalizations. Um, but as John, as John, you know, said, one of the most important things to do is to train people. And you're already doing that, right? Um, practice good password hygiene. That's that's an important one. Use a password manager. Make sure your passwords are different from everything, um, and make sure your passwords are. I really don't use human friendly passwords for anything. You know what I mean? They're all at least sixteen characters, twenty four, some cases more, and there's technical reasons for that. Uh, and then I already mentioned this. Use multi factor authentication. Multi factor authentication is no longer expensive or complicated. Um, and you know. I, the first time I heard of multi-factor authentication was at Drill Weekend in the Air Force. I want to say in like 2003. This is like 20 years ago, right? Um, so the Department of Defense, you know, which was the catalyst for the creation of the internet and TCP/IP anyway, um, has been kind of at the you know the cutting edge of uh, cybersecurity the entire time. So these things that we that I'm now now starting to see come out into the small and mid-sized business, SIEM, EDR, MFA. These were things that the enterprise had years ago, and it makes me very happy to see these enterprise level technologies now being available to the SMB, especially in an affordable cost. But um, I can't stress enough how important it is to use MFA because stealing passwords is easy um, and it can and will be done. Most data thieves are organized professional criminals. I can't drive that point home enough. Um, I think everybody here is is a business. Um, Seamless Solutions is a business. A lot of these organizations look, smell, taste, and operate exactly like a business, right? 
It's just that what they're doing is unethical and immoral, and it might not even necessarily be illegal depending on what jurisdiction they're in. Now, most of the developed world, what we call the Western nations, they have legal prohibitions on hacking both inside and outside their borders. Not every country is like that. Some countries have legal prohibitions on hacking inside the borders, but not outside their borders. Uh, Russia gets picked on a lot these days in the news, but Russia is one of them. So let's say that, you know, th these are, uh, they're, they're companies. They'll have engineers, project managers, they have lists, um, all these things. So they have all the things a mature business would have. They have a building, they have financial targets. And then what they're doing is they're expropriating money from their targets that are usually a right they know exactly what they're doing they pick their targets carefully and they do it in such a way that they don't attract the attention of you know for example the fbi or interpol they keep their targets small and then they have lists of verticals that they specifically avoid law enforcement uh defense things like that finance in a lot of cases you know what i mean they're they're pretty pretty mature and sophisticated you know so do not underestimate them um this is not a 400 pound fat guy in his parents basement uh, this is not people in hoodies. These are professional engineers. Um, and let me throw out an interesting aside here. Now, think about this. For all of its other failings, um, <laughs> what we, uh, a STEM education, or at least what we call STEM now in the communist bloc was really good, right? Even in, even in Russia and Eastern Europe, their STEM education is still really good, right? So you have these these kids that were taking trigonometry in seventh grade and these sorts of things. There's a lot of emphasis on STEM. So they have education in STEM that is better than in the Western world typically, but a lack of economic opportunity. So they're looking to leverage this. You know what I mean? Um, it, it, it's just, it's so interesting, these things. Uh, there's a couple more numbers here about the uh, system intrusion events, and I'm not gonna sit and read these, but, um, Look at the second one, though. 40% of ransomware incidents involve desktop sharing software, RDP. RDP is dangerous. If you have any questions about RDP, ask John about it. He'll tell you why you shouldn't use it. Just don't, please, um, unless it's absolutely necessary and then you have mitigating controls in place because it's it's uh, almost always easy to, bre uh, to brute force this. So here's another uh, some other considerations. Study the NIST cybersecurity framework. If you have the time and you're so inclined, um, the best thing about the NIST cybersecurity framework is that it's free to download. And then I'm, I apologize, my phone's ringing. I apologize, I meant to mute that. Uh, create and practice an incident response plan. By the way, if you don't have an incident response plan today, um, ask John. I will give you one for free. I have one that I got from the Defense Security Service, DSS.mil, a couple of years ago that's NIST aligned that I found it to be a great fit for most companies. It's a seven pager, it's a boilerplate, uh, and it'll give you a great starting point. Regularly review your security procedures, just like you do with your safety and your finance and your other things. Every business has things they do on a regular basis, right? Uh, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, your secure cyber security should be part of that. Make sure you keep your software up to date. Seamless Solutions, of course, can help you with that. Uh, keep an eye on SIZE's website, look at the ransomware notice. And then um, lastly, you can also look at ConnectWise's uh, ConnectWise security trust and compliance site. And one of the key points about ConnectWise here is ConnectWise has, I think, 17,000 partners and that all serve the SMB space. And most of our clients are small to mid-sized businesses, anywhere from one to two people up to 100. Some of them are, thou you know, 1,000. Uh, and there are some that are, you know, bigger than that. But my point is, is ConnectWise has probably more intelligence, more real-time intelligence about the small to mid-sized business space than probably any other company. So next, we're going to talk about SIEM and MDR. We're going to start getting into the meat and the potatoes here a little bit, right? Because now I've spent the last 30 minutes scaring the crap out of everybody. So now we need to, you know, help. You know, what can we do do about this a little bit? So. Uh, we're going to talk about SIEM. SIEM is security information and event management, and I'm not going to get into that too much because it's not the purpose of this particular webinar, but it is uh, it is an important protective technology. <clears throat> All the devices that are on your network, they generate system logs, uh, and it doesn't matter if it's routers, switches, I'm shutting my phone off, I apologize. Uh, it could be your uh, workstations, routers, servers, switches, IoT, uh, access points, everything, it all, it all makes logs, which 
which are effectively, if you don't do anything about them, they're just noise. And all that, all those logs mean something, right? Uh, a seams is a way to ingest all of those logs into actionable intelligence, right? Think about, um, if you've seen on TV, think about an AWAC plane. The Boeing is at a 707 or a 737 with the disc on top that flies over the battlefield, right? And it's looking at, you know, tanks, troops, ships, missiles, uh, radar, and all these other things. And then it fuses that data together into actionable intelligence for when the commanders need to do something. That's uh, kind of kind of what a seam does. And why do you need it? If you have auditing and compliance requirements, depending on what vertical you serve, if you're in healthcare or finance, uh, or if you work in your manufacturing defense, there's a bunch of different business verticals that have auditing compliance requirements for different reasons. And if you have those things, talk to Seamless and they can help you bring in, uh, you know, bring in a seam to help you comply with these things. Um, and look at the lower right here. This is a key point here. SEAM allows for detailed forensic analysis in the event of a successful security breach. Remember what I was saying before about the TTPs, John? Uh, the tacti the techni techniques to, and, to, and procedures, the serial killer stuff, right? These are the breadcrumbs, right? SEAM creates a trail of breadcrumbs so that if they get through, we can go back in and then look at the logs and then figure out what happened. That, that, that part's important. Tools, techniques, and procedures. What, um, I usually use this in my sales presentations, but I, I just like this slide because I think it's funny. But here's one of the problems. The seam is kind of abstract, right? It's an abstract. So the engineers, people like me or people like John, we say seam is a critical protective de 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 detective technology. It's great. I love seam. But the CFO, they're the ones signing the contract. They have to pay for it. They're like, what does this even do? I, I don't get this. You know what I mean? Uh, and then the users, they, you know, they don't care because it doesn't do anything for them, right? It doesn't enhance the user experience. It, does, it doesn't make your mouse any faster. It doesn't make your browsing any faster. It doesn't do anything. It just kind of sits there and does its thing. Um, and I like Arlie Army. So uh, I'm going to go through this and get to MDR, but this is a quick slide about uh, the perch sock and our our socks uh, our sock is available through seamless and this is something that also ties into uh, managed detection and response but the connectwise sock has 160 people in it 24 7 365 that are watching all this stuff that can take action in real time uh, in tandem with seamless solutions uh so seam and edr and we're talking mainly about uh edr and mdr here uh, EDR and MDR are basically next generation endpoint protection, uh, next next generation uh, antivirus, so to speak. But it's a lot more complicated than uh, antivirus, and I'm going to get into that in a minute here. Let me roll through my slides. So I want to talk about uh, this. This is really important here because this is the main reason why we're having this discussion because people have been stuck on antivirus kind of, you know, since, well, the 90s, right? Um, antivirus is crude technology. It's basically pattern matching, right? So you have some piece of malicious logic, a, a worm, a virus, or whatever it is, and then we use a mathematical function called a hash, uh, an algorithm in order to hash this thing, and then we make a fingerprint, and then we put it in a database, and we know what it looks like, right? And then when we see it again, boom, we've got a hit, and then we know that this is something we have to quarantine. So basically what this means is the threat has to be known. Um, it, it can only pick up known threats. Old school antivirus can only pick up known threats. Um, EDR and MDR, endpoint detection and response, and managed detection and response, they go way beyond simple pattern matching, and they also have pattern recognition, right? So if it even looks like a piece of malicious logic or it looks like a worm, uh, and it does this a number of different ways. It actually does code analysis. It looks at the code. Uh, it looks at the behavior. What is it doing? It's changing permissions. Is it traversing directories? Is it fooling with the registry? Is it installing software? So um, EDR is a high degree of intelligence to it that uh, antivirus just, just simply lacks. So EDR and MDR is, is behavior-based. It has forensics capabilities. Uh, and not only can it quarantine and isolate malicious logic, it actually undo the damage that it did in real time. So let's say that we have a piece of, um, you know, a piece of software, malicious logic that is damaging a system. 
uh, is changing permissions or altering the registry, EDR and MDR could actually reverse that stuff in real time, undo the damage in real time. Uh, traditional antivirus cannot do this. It just can't. And one of the analogies that I like to make is that, you know, early on in my slides, I talked about how much cybersecurity has changed and continues to change, right? Um, old school antivirus is like having a car with crumple zones and seatbelts. It's better than a car without crumple zones and seatbelts, right? Um, but, it, you know, is it something you're going to let your kid drive? No, probably not really. You know what I mean? Um, EDR and MDR, now you have a car that has seatbelts and crumple zones, and now we're adding onto that anti-lock brakes, we're adding on traction control, and then let's put in collision avoidance and let's put in lane departure warning and all these other things, right? All these automated gizmos. And the difference is, I mean, think about it. You could go out and buy a car now for $21,000, a Hyundai that has automatic braking on it, right? And, you know, you're not paying attention for a second and the kid runs out in the road, the car is going to stop itself. A car with uh, seat belts and crumple zones isn't going to do that. It's going to hit the kid. That's what AV, that's what traditional AV is. You know what I mean? So th this is a risk-based decision. Uh, can you drive a car that just has crumple zones and seatbelts? Actually, you can. I'm a car nerd, and I have probably two like that. I'm an old Mercedes like that. I don't drive it a whole lot. I don't let my kids drive it. You know what I mean? But if you're going to drive grandma around or drive your kids around or you're, you know, protecting your crown jewels, then you want... Um, you know, these advanced protective technologies, uh, things like your EDR and, and your MDR. These are very, very important. So that said, I'm going to get into the difference between EDR and MDR a little bit here. OK, so um, I think we've covered pretty well what the difference between traditional AV and EDR is EDR and point detection and response. Now, EDR, MDR is EDR, but with humans watching it. Right. And you can get this through seamless solutions. And in a perfect world, we would put MDR on everything, but we all know that that would be cost prohibitive. Right. So we're going to take a look at we're going to do an assessment. We're going to find out what are your crown jewels? What are the things we can't do without? An example of something you can't do without might be, for example, ERP, enter Enterprise Resource Planning, if you're a manufacturer, right? Um, ERP, if you don't know, runs your your um, your manufacturing your uh, your manufacturing line, right? So if your ERP doesn't work, you're not manufacturing anything. You're hemorrhaging cash. You're not making any money, right? So your tolerance for risk with something like that is basically zero. So you want to have MDR and something like that. Now, conversely, let's say AP and AR, uh, uh, accounts payable and accounts receivable. Those things are very, very important. But if AP and AR are down for half a day, it's not the end of the world. We're not going to hemorrhage cash. It's more of a nuisance than anything. We're working some overtime. Um, so those kinds of things, maybe uh, we want to have EDR on that. So um, I definitely want to see MDR on your crown jewels, um, things like your critical domain controllers. Uh, intellectual property, things to protect PHI, things to protect PII. PHI is protected health information, protected uh, information, um, uh, proprietary information. You know, one of my favorite uh, stories about proprietary information was that um, uh, China had gotten into DuPont a couple years back and stole the recipe for white paint. They'll, they'll take anything, you know what I mean? Um, so when it comes to your crown jewels, you want to have MDR on those things. So Here's an analogy for you. Uh, John Ears, remember the movie War Games? You know what NORAD is, right? Right. We've all, we've all seen movies with NORAD in it. So you have. Oh, God, you NORAD. Have, That's great. Yeah. Right. You have um, you have an operations center, a security operations center, and then you have people watching screens and you have humans. Right. And, uh, you know, when you have a high risk situation, if you have a threat coming in, you need a human to act on that in real time. Right. So. EDR would be like NORAD that was fully automated with computers, and that's a lot better than AV. But MDR, that's NORAD with people in it, right? That's where we have zero risk for a bad out, uh, zero tolerance for risk with a bad outcome. So when it comes to our crown jewels, our really important assets, we want that MDR on our uh, MDR on there. That's that's our NORAD, right? So that's what uh, seem is providing for its clients via its partnership with ConnectWise is a NORAD-like capability where you have a sock filled with humans that is uh, watching watching uh, for these threats in real time for you. Legacy antivirus. Um, this will be in the PDFs that we can hand out after. Uh, again, I think I've kind of already covered this. I talk a lot and sometimes I get ahead, ahead of myself in my slides. I get excited, right? 
So this is a couple of engineering level slides about uh, exactly what EDR does. We can go back to that. But again, as, as I mentioned, it can do real time file analysis. Antivirus doesn't do this. It does code and it can actually, uh, analyze flat files. It can act, uh, analyze code. It does actual remediation, kill and quarantine. It can actually clean it up, roll it back. It can disconnect a computer from the network. So let's hypothetically say that this high value asset, whatever it is, is being attacked, right? Your um, domain controller or your um, uh, enter enterprise resource planning. It can actually temporarily disconnect the thing from the network with the exception of that SOC human operator that has access to that asset. And that helps to, to firewall the damage, to contain the damage so it can't do anything else. Uh, it has anti-tamper built into it, is local firework work control, uh, control. It's very, very, uh, very, very sophisticated stuff. Uh, here I have a slide about our cyber research unit, and this is something that ConnectWise stood up within the last couple of years as part of our uh, acquisition of Perch. Um, but ConnectWise is doing some very, very good work in terms of proprietary research and data collection. And again, we're getting the vast majority of this stuff from the small to mid-sized business space. And other companies don't, you know, they just don't have this intelligence, you know, that we do. And, and there's big companies, you know, like, uh, there, there's a bunch of big enterprise companies don't necessarily have any penetration. I don't need to drop names, but they don't necessarily have any penetration into the small to mid-sized business space. So they just don't know what ConnectWise does. 17,000 partners and, you know, hundreds of thousands of endpoints under management. that are small to mid-sized businesses. So we have more intelligence and more data about the SMB space. And these, this is the information that our cyber research unit is using to generate our reports and then provide uh, information for our cyber research unit. Um, and, you know, and in, including the intelligence, security, content, threat hunting, so on and so forth. Now we're, we're going to talk about security risk assessments, and this is something I feel really strongly about. Right? Um, you, you, you know, this is like getting your cholesterol checked. We we need to know this stuff. We just do, right? So you don't know. And by the way, know. everybody who who comes to the seminar today can use the code at the end of the seminar to get a free security check. Can't do anything better than that, right? So, you know, no, no cost obligation. If they want to do a security check, we are offering it at no cost to anybody who's here today for this uh, for this webinar. So I, I have this slide because I think it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. And look what it says up here, because you don't know, you don't know, right? This is a, a service entrance on the side of a house. We've all seen this thing, right? It's somewhere. This happens to be my house. It was built in 1760. This picture was taken 15 years ago, right? But you look at it like, okay, it's a, it's a service entrance. So what? Who cares, right? It doesn't mean anything. It's actually wrong. It's, it's wrong. It needs to be fixed. Um, look at the one on the left here. The one on the left has a drip loop on it, right? So the wires on the left, when it rains and they get wet, the water runs down the drip loop and then drips off it and then hits the ground so it doesn't go into that weather head up there, right? So it can't run down into the jacket sheath and short it out. Now, mine, mine doesn't have a drip loop, right? So that will get wet and the water will run into the weather head and it could short the thing out. You don't know what you don't know. And this is why you hire, you bring in an expert to tell you things like this. I didn't know this until somebody pointed out to me. I've seen this these things thousands of times. They just didn't know that. So... Uh, the, compo the components of a well-designed cybersecurity solution for your business, there's a lot of things that go into this, right? And nobody here, I don't expect any of you to have all of these things today. This is desired end state. Uh, I can assure you that Seamless does all of these things internally, and there's probably many clients that are doing all these things too, for. Um, enterprise does all of these things. Uh, security assessment, awareness, passwords, DNS protection, computer updates, backup. This, this is all part of a defense and depth strategy. Uh, if you go to, you know, Lockheed Martin or Nabisco or Microsoft or whatever, the hospital system, any place that has information security, people are going to have all these things. But, you know, as Confucius said, uh, the journey of a million miles begins with the first step. And, you know, my grandfather, he started out as a building contractor. He used to say that you have to get up on the uh, uh, roof and pound in the first nail, right? It's the same exact thing. But we need to start with a security assessment. And that's where we're going to finish off, off here today. I'm going to get into this a little bit about why a security assessment is so important because you don't know what you don't know. 
so first, security assessment. I think you may have figured out that I love my analogies. We're going to use a house for an analogy here, right? Uh, your house, this is your house. It's something that you want to keep secure. So I'm going to kind of, I don't love animated slides per se. I'm going to kind of go through some of these things here and then I'll add all of them in, right? So the first step here is going to be to, to identify. That's what a security assessment does, right? In your home, we, don't want, we want to identify what it is that we want to protect, right? What's important for your crown jewels, your family, of course, is your number one thing, your pets, uh, collectibles, maybe grandpa's watch, grandma's jewelry, documents and valuables, your passports, uh, birth certificates, life insurance, those kinds of things. Maybe, uh, you know, electronics and computers, stupid things. A thousand dollars anymore, it's crazy to me, right? Uh, now, what are we gonna do to protect those? Doors and windows, locks. Uh, education, we talked about that, right? You want to, um, you know, educate your kids, educate your spouse, neighbors, yard signs. Um, those are uh, a type, a particular type of uh, control. It's uh, a deterrent control is a yard sign, actually. It's all it does is maybe deter somebody, right? Uh, and then detect. We want uh, alarm, motion sensor, doorbell camera, neighborhood watch, uh, respond. You have a dog, insurance, police, some type of a weapon, depending on what part of the country you are and your politics are, this might mean different things. Um, I live in rural Pennsylvania, so I can assure you it's not a baseball bat. And uh, the last piece of this here is recover. Uh, and in this case, we're mapping this to uh, the cybersecurity. But look at the top here. What it has is identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, this is what's called the NIST cybersecurity uh, CSF, cyber, uh, uh, the, the NIST cybersecurity focus plan, a uh, framework rather, excuse me. Let me um, take a sip of my coffee, John. I have so many yeah, acronyms. Yeah, you've been talking, you've been talking this whole time straight. I'm kind of amazed that you haven't lost your voice yet, but you're doing great. We appreciate I, it. Between, between being in the military and being in IT, and in the military, I was in two different career fields. I was an aircraft mechanic, and then I cross-trained in communications. I know so many acronyms. Sometimes I forget acronyms that I say every day, like CSF. What is that? It's a cybersecurity framework. But in any case, this is the NIST cybersecurity framework. And pretty much everything that ConnectWise and its partners are doing, and our partners are doing, including uh, 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 including Seamless, all works off the NIST cybersecurity framework. And this is uh, this is a maturity framework that kind of, it goes in a circle. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And we're always in one of these phases, right? And respond and recover is when we have an incident of some kind. And we know these things are gonna happen at some, at some point. But um, back to John's point earlier, uh, my call to action for all of you here today is to start with this identify piece over on the left because you don't know what you don't know. We need to go in there. We need to see, number one, what are your crown jewels? What are the things we really need to protect? Um, and then what are we doing to protect them? Um, um, where are we today? What's our desired end state? And then some type of a plan to get from where we are now uh, to where we need to be uh, with an assessment. And, you know, with... Uh, Again, like I said, to me, this is like getting a cholesterol test. You just need to do it. I can't uh, stress that point enough, the importance of having an assessment. Uh, so this is what we're saying is the right cybersecurity, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, got a slide here on compliance. MDR, uh, I'd mentioned compliance and SEAM earlier before. Some of you may recognize some of, uh, some of this stuff. There's different compliance frameworks. Compliance is something that I worked a lot with, specifically uh, CMMC. You may recognize some of these if you work in defense. Probably everybody's heard of HIPAA because you've been to the dentist, right? Um, or you've been to the doctors. We all know have some notional idea what HIPAA is. ITAR is arm, arms export. Not everybody knows what that is. Um, SOX, that's a funny one, Sarbanes-Oxley. I'll, I'll tell you a, a story about how SOX came about. Remember Enron? Yeah. Yeah. That's so, exactly that's that's exactly where Sorbanes came from. We un, here, here's you know here's, we unrestricted here's the, them. Here's the nutshell story behind this, right? We've all heard we've all heard the phrase "cooking the books," right? Back in the bad old days, you could cook the cook the books with a pencil. So you have the CFO or the financial people or whatever, and they have their results for the board, and they're not happy with them. They're the you know we missed our Q2 results. We're worried about our stock that's going down, right? 
Now, it used to be that you could cook the books with a pencil, but everything became automated. So somebody uh, in, in, you know, somebody in the C-suite, I don't know, CFO or whoever it was, goes back to the IT people, a database administrator, and then shows them a field in the report, right? And says, hey, you see this number right here? Where, um, where, where is this in the database? And the, and the database administrator says, oh, well, it's, you know, chucka chucka, it's in this field here. And, uh, you know, they said, hey, can you change that? And well, yeah, sure. <laughs> so the database administrator changes it and they regenerate the report. So they start cooking the books virtually instead of electronically and they got caught. Right. And what is the database administrator going to tell the executive? No. You know what I mean? They're going to they're do what they're told. Uh, so that's how we end up with socks because because of that. It's, it's terrible. Uh, GLBA, that's financial. Um, some of you may have contractual requirements. Sometimes you might have a contract with, um, you know, some company and they're going to have cybersecurity requirements for you. Uh, other things to consider policy, acceptable use policy, bring your own device, cloud, work from home, encryption. Uh, process, you incident response plan. Again, if you don't have one, um, ping John after this and then I'll, I'll, I'll John, I'm going to send you the incident response plan I have that you can give it uh, give out. Um, backup recovery, disaster recovery are important things. Change management. Look what I have down here under process, return on investment. Um, I don't want you doing any of this stuff for the heck of it, right? Um, businesses exist to be pat or cash flow positive. You have to watch your numbers. And remember my first couple slides that talked about what cybersecurity means, right? Um, cybersecurity doesn't mean just putting in firewalls, doing policies and procedures, endpoint protection, deep pack and inspection, all these other things. Cybersecurity means risk management. It means understanding what our risk is and then reducing that risk in a systematic way that aligns with our business objectives, doesn't uh, negatively impact operations in unacceptable ways and doesn't cost too much money. It's risk management. Like I said, in a perfect world, I would love to put MDR in everything, but MDR costs money and we're not going to do that. We're going to figure out what's our crown jewels and that's where we're going to put MDR. We're going to put EDR and everything else. Uh, and then I've got uh, a tech technology, MFA, EDR, scene backups. Backups are very important. We're not covering that in this particular slideshow. Uh, I have a little bit of time for Q&A. And then I'm going to go back to this in a minute because I love to get feedback from people on my presentations. Um, John had mentioned this before, free security assessment. Um, get with John after this and they will do a baseline security assessment for you. And that will get you on your first step to identify. Please, please do this. Uh, and then I'm going to, um, here's my email address if anybody would like to reach me. And I'm going to end off with this QR code here. Um, it would help me personally. This um, program that ConnectWise is doing with our partners where we do these webinars uh, in partnership and on behalf of our partners is fairly new. Uh, and I'm trying to get better at this. So um, if you could do me a personal favor and then QR code, code that quick. And it's like six questions. Any uh, follow up comments there, John? I said an, an awful lot in an hour. You went through an awful lot in an hour, but uh, you know we hit we hit our time just right. So I appreciate that. And anything that anybody needs, you guys know always. You can reach out to me directly, or you can reach out to my team, and we'll we'll get you all set up. Um, we are planning on saving and, and publishing out to the people. Um, you know all, all this information. We'll put this on our YouTube channel so that uh, y'all can review it at your leisure. Um, the idea behind this is, you know, 2023 is really a big push for, for Seamless to really come back to our customers and focus in on things um, around security. And th that's a complete, um, you know, overhaul of the, the, the security stuff. And that's, you know, we, MDR is just a piece of that package. We do have our, you know, other pieces, the SIM tool. We have we have uh, training. We have um, our our mfa for for the local desktop all the way to the server you know all the kind of stuff that can help you out to be a more secure company and if there are any needs or any questions please let us know and, and we're here to help you and if uh, right. anybody has any questions or like to pick my brain go ahead and um you know you can ask john yeah or are you know if there are any questions guys you can post them now otherwise we're gonna we're going to end this uh, this this webinar and hopefully see you guys at the next one. OK. Katie, if you can uh, end the webinar for us, that would be great. 
Bye, everybody.